Hi folks, Dr. Dicek. It is uh, Monday evening. Just want to check in with you folks, make sure everybody's okay in our continuing educational forum on COVID and other uh, related health issues. Um, well, a couple of things to cover tonight. First of all, uh, as we always do, we try to keep you updated on recent studies and new findings. Um, uh, in a study that was just uh, pre-printed actually before peer review out of, uh, interestingly enough, out of Wuhan, uh, China, the large children's hospital in that province. Uh, they reported on something that we're all interested in on uh, COVID effects on children. Uh, and they actually uh, did what's called a retrospective study, which they went back and looked at the records of uh, children admitted to the hospital. Uh, they looked at the records of 127 children who were admitted to children's hospital uh, over a period of the uh, crisis over several months. Uh, these were children who were proven PCR positive with COVID. Uh, the me median age was about seven years old. Unfortunately, out of the 127, two of the children had passed away. Uh, what was interesting is 80% of the children admitted actually had other medical conditions, uh, which is the challenge uh, you know all of us are facing, especially uh, those of us who run programs like I do, like the Kids of Courage program, uh, very big risks right now in terms of figuring out how to uh, do activities with them and, and safe ways for them to get together until we have a vaccine. So 80% of the children actually had comorbidities. Uh, most important part of the finding uh, of the study actually was uh, the finding that children apparently don't develop the dramatic over response of the immune system uh, that causes that uh, very uh, famous cytokine storm that we've spoken about and you all heard about. Uh, what they did is they looked in the study at uh, the um, levels of the immune mediators, interleukin-2, interleukin-4, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, and uh, different types of interferon in the, in the serum of these children. And they found that they actually don't develop the dramatically high levels of those immune uh, mediators that adults do, which are suspected to be the cause of the cytokine storm, which damages so much lung tissue. Uh, importantly, uh, as part of the study, knowing that children don't have this dramatic over-immune response or hyper-immune response, it's important to know because the therapies that we're researching now uh, in adults targeting uh, anti-cytokine storm uh, activities of the immune system probably won't be effective in children. So uh, it's an important small study just noting that children uh, part of the reason they cope with it better, apparently, is because they don't develop this over-immune response when they get sick. The problem in children is that apparently the rare complication of Kawasaki-like syndrome or toxic shock syndrome, uh, they appear to develop those immune hyperactivity uh, features as part of a COVID recovery syndrome, not during the actual COVID infection. Um, just a little bit about what's going on throughout the country. All of you know about the terrible crisis now. There's dramatic increase in cases across about 32, 33 states right now. Uh, very um, scary and difficult time for many of those states, including Florida and Texas and California right now. Uh, but I, I wanted to show you as a, to demonstrate how we're all interconnected. Um, because the commercial labs in those uh, parts of the country aren't yet fully equipped and prepared, to do the dramatic number of tests that need to be done. A lot of those tests are being actually performed here up north uh, through uh, some of the commercial labs like LabCorp Quest. And we know about it because uh, those of us who can't do rapid testing where we have to send a PCR specimen to the lab to test for COVID, where we were seeing turnaround times in the last uh, uh, few weeks of two days, now we're seeing turnaround times of seven, eight days in some cases. So the labs are getting overwhelmed in the Northeast as a result of the uh, activities or the spread of the disease down South. Um, that's just demonstrative of how we're interconnected. There's not unlimited amount of reagent, there's not unlimited amount of any of these things, including medications. Uh, remdesivir now, the FDA as of yesterday is now redirecting large supplies of remdesivir to the south and southern states, which they should be uh, in a desperate effort to get them all the medicine they need. Um, it's really challenging now because of the new surge uh, of cases throughout the United States. Um, we're seeing even difficulties on the vaccine studies because the studies now 
uh, have to recruit, uh, it's preferential to recruit in areas where there are a large number of cases uh, because you want to be able to study the vaccine in these phase three trials uh, in communities where the disease is very active to make sure the vaccine is effective. Uh, the problem with recruiting during time of crisis is that the healthcare systems in those areas are under such stress right now that the vaccine recruitment is becoming more difficult because most of the people involved in healthcare in the Southwest right now or in the Southern states are extremely, extremely busy just caring for patients. They don't have a lot of time for recruitment uh, for vaccine studies. So, um, you know, it's hard to recruit during times of great crisis in the healthcare uh, area. Um, importantly enough, what, you know, because we're, you know, gearing up for the fall and winter season, and we don't know if the vaccine is gonna arrive in November and December after January. Right now, there's a lot of, uh, uh, unknowns about the vaccine, whether it'll get here in time for that period where the, where the COVID winter infections may interfere with the flu or may come at the same time as the flu respiratory infections. So there's a lot of research going on and very quick research going on for the use of monoclonal antibodies. Uh, we spoke about monoclonal antibodies before in the forum, just to repeat what they are. A monoclonal antibodies are uh, antibodies that are produced naturally by the immune system in response to viruses or bacteria or even cancer cells. When the human body detects virus, bacteria, or cancer cells, uh, it produces naturally these antibodies that mark those cells and the, then we, our body tries to kill those cells. So through recombinant DNA technology, many companies are now able to make um, uh, these monoclonal antibodies synthetically and to s clone them and reproduce them in large numbers. So how much monoclonal, how, what can we do with those monoclonal antibodies? We can do two things. One, we can give what's called passive immunity, which means temporary immunity until the vaccine arrives to every human being in the world, if we can get enough of it. Uh, and the next thing it could be done is to trick, treat sick patients with specific monoclonal uh, antibodies uh, that we can treat patients who are mild or moderately or even severely sick to try to turn the disease process around. So really the research is not complete yet on monoclonal antibodies. It's being completed now. Even once the research is finished, we need to be able to gear up capacity for production. The United States alone would need probably 50 million doses of monoclonal antibody. Um, so this is going to be a bridge uh, to a vaccine uh, and in, as we spoke earlier in the forum in previous discussions for senior citizens who can't mount a great immune response to a typical vaccine, there's even discussions of giving them a vaccine and monoclonal antibodies to give them additional passive immunity. Um, just in closing, I wanna talk about what we're seeing right now in the New York area. As we've said in the past few weeks, thank God the disease activity has been dramatically down. However, we are seeing signs of uptick right now. I got calls in the last 72 hours. Many of my patients are relocated to Deal, New Jersey, a summer community now. Uh, there have been a significant number of exposures in Deal in the last few days. Uh, unfortunately, I got uh, uh, four calls and emails today of people who are exposed to new positives. Uh, this is definitely occurring now. Uh, unfortunately, the activities in deals in deal not across the whole community, but many members of the community are ignoring the warnings that we spoke about, the use of masks. Uh, I've been told there have been some big parties, indoor parties, especially with very little social distancing. Um, I want to warn people, if you're going to ignore these advisories, especially in the context of what we now know that we're seeing an uptick in cases, uh, we could be looking at significant difficulties in the coming weeks. It takes weeks to build up the number of cases where we're going to notice hospitalizations and unfortunately deaths, God forbid. So please, I'm appealing to everybody. It, it's very distressing for me and other physicians to be getting phone calls from individuals that they've been exposed, that they now have to go into quarantine, etc. cetera. Uh, we don't want to slip back to where we were in April we see what happens when things are released too quickly or when we ignore the advisories like what happened on Memorial Day, which we're now seeing the effects of in the Southwest and in Florida. 
uh, we don't want to be back in that position four weeks from now. So please, everybody, obey all of the advisories. Use masks when you're out in public, certainly when you're indoors with other people other than your family. Um, don't attend these large crowded events where people are not social distancing or using masks. It's just not worth it. And we don't want you to have to pay the ultimate price by getting somebody else infected who can't afford to be infected. So let's follow the rules and get through these next few weeks. Um, we'll check in with you guys tomorrow. Hope you have a good evening. Take care.